Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Pokemon Soul Silver. In the last part, we set about exploring the battle frontier, showing off what the challenges are like in the process, and now it's time for us to sort of conclude our business here in the battle frontier, by and large, by showing off what a fight against each of the frontier brains is like. Now, as you saw a moment ago, you do need to have a certain type of wind streak to reach any given frontier brain. Their first battles, barring the battle hall, are all at the 21st consecutive win. Uh, the battle hall is the only one that's a little different as I brought up last part. You need to win 50 battles in a row there for that to happen, but that's honestly still a bit quicker. The slightly annoying thing with each frontier brain fight is you do have to reach the end of a tier to do it. It's not like, congratulations, you've won 21 battles in a row, so you're 20 seconds this battle after the fact. You need to reach the end of that third marathon. Kyle, congratulations! You ought to be commended on your mastery for keeping the streak alive. Our owner, appreciating your worth, demands you battle the Castle Ballet. You're prepared, yes? The important thing to note for every single Frontier Brain is that if the area has a gimmick to it, like the Battle Castle, uh, Factory, or Arcade, you are still able to take advantage of that prior to the fight against the Frontier Brain. So in this case, you can heal up your Pokémon, you can check the Castle Valet's Pokémon and their levels, or even boost or lower them as they, as they need be, which as you can see based off just what's going on the bottom screen there, I have actively toyed around with leveling up some stuff with Castle Points. And I believe I even end up lowering their levels because the Frontier Brain fights are definitely the hardest for the point you fight them in the Battle Frontier. With that said, they're also the most set in most cases. For instance, the Castle Valet at the 21st battle only has two potential teams, both of which have Star Raptors and Polyons and Houndooms. Uh, the big difference comes down to uh, movesets overall. Very well, please proceed. Welcome. I am Durak, as you know, and I am the Castle Valet. Lady Caitlin, my employer, is not one to accept defeat willingly. However, for a reason I'm not at liberty to disclose, she cannot battle. Consequently, I'll do battle in her ladyship's place. Let me assure you that you won't be shortchanged by facing me. On guard! Thus, our first Frontier Brain fight. I love the Frontier Brain fight theme from Generation 4. It's such a good energy. Duroc, as we saw, has three Pokémon. Staraptor, Empoleon, and Houndoom. The big difference comes down to, between the two variations of this fight, what the movesets of each Pokémon are. They are even still all holding the same item. For instance, Empoleon here is holding a Razor Claw, meaning it has a higher critical hit ratio. Uh, one of the Empoleon sets has either Waterfall, Metal Claw, Break, Brick Break, and Knock Off, or Drill Peck, Aqua Jet, Shadow Claw, and Rock Slide you will probably not be able to determine, without looking at the moves in the Castle Point menu beforehand, which one you're fighting, so you need to be a little be careful and be prepared for both, honestly. So since this particular Empoleon knows Brick Break, I know I'm fighting the first variation of Duroc's team here, not his second one. Now, we're gonna show off the reward for this down the line. You're, there is a second battle with each Frontier Brain you can do if you continue keeping the Wind Streak alive. With the exception of the Battle Hall, it happens at the 49th consecutive battle, so you need to have won seven streaks in a row, essentially. As for what Duroc's team down the line is, he has an Entei with a Shukaberry, so it's guaranteed to take half damage from the first ground type move you use. An Empoleon with Quick Claw, so it can just move first at random. And a Gallade with a Scope Lens, which increases the holder's critical hit ratio. Uh, as for the two moves that you can fight into that, the Entei could have Fire Blast, Solar Beam, Hyper Beam, or Sunny Day or Overheat, Extrasensory, Shadow Ball, and Calm Mind. The Empoleon can have Surf, Earthquake, Blizzard, and Signal Beam, or Hydro Cannon, Flash Cannon, Drill Peck, and Earthquake. The Gatling can have Psycho Cut, Stone Edge, Aerial Ice, and Excisor, or Psycho Cut, Close Combat, Leaf Blade, and Night Slash. Now let's talk about his first fight's Houndoom. Uh, it's always holding a Focus Sash, so you basically cannot one-shot this thing no matter what. It's guaranteed to hold on with 1 HP due to that. Uh, the Sturdy ability would also gain this as sort of a subset, starting, I think, in the next generation. Uh, the two movesets it can have are Fire Fang, Crunch, Roar, and Counter, or Fire Fang, Thunder Fang, Reversal, and Endure. However, since we saw that the Empoleon has Brick Break, this is the one that has Fire Fang, Crunch, Roar, and Counter. The important thing to note about a lot of Frontier Brain Pokémon as well, 
they have more or less maxed out effort values in at least two or three of their stats that are very beneficial to that particular Pokemon. As I briefly went over earlier in the LP, effort values are essentially a hidden experience point that you gain from defeating Pokemon. If I recall the exact way it works, it's like... Any given Pokemon you defeat that gives experience will give one to three effort points. And for every four effort points in a stat at max level, that stat is one point higher. So say, uh, Mortis here has four points in physical defense. At level 100, her base defense will be one higher than it should be. It's a way to sort of customize your Pokemon overall. Uh, but it only really matters in the Battle Frontier and competitive, casually. It really doesn't matter unless you're a super min-maxer. For now, let's talk about Duroc's Star Raptor. It can, it's holding a King's Rock, so any of its moves can cause you to flinch. It can either have Return, Aerial Ace, Double Team, and Roost, or Endeavor, Aerial Ace, Endure, and Quick Attack. But, since this is the first team, it's the one that has Return. My Pokémon cannot be faulted in any way, shape, or form. My hat's off to you. Kyle, you are truly in possession of a superlative talent. I'd drawn every reserve of experience and etiquette handed down through our heritage of glorious servitude. But even then, I failed to fend off your inspired and inspiring challenge. I shall see to appeasing Lady Caitlin's displeasure at my loss. Kyle, please do return to our battle castle. Unlikely! We will be delighted and feel privileged to have you back. Durak, castle points for this trainer at once. Oh, Kyle, good show, a hot fight win, yes? I totally didn't just take an L. Lady Caitlin has instructed me to award you with 21 castle points. And, uh, like I forgot to mention at the end of last part, whenever you finish a streak of battles, you can save your last win for your battle video, which can be shared with other players. It was sort of like a here's one of my best wins sort of things. Beating a Frontier Brain generally gives you a guaranteed 20 plus uh, battle points as well, so that's pretty handy. But more importantly, we're gonna get something else in just a moment. Congratulations! In recognition of your victory, we present you with a commemorative print. The silver print was added to our Versus Recorder. These are what I talked about last part, where you essentially get a gym badge for beating a Frontier Brain. At 21 victories, you're given what's known as a silver print, and at 49 victories, you're given a gold print. I'm not going for the gold prints in this LP, but I still want to show them off. The main difference is whether or not the background's in just grayscale or color. That's the silver print right there. And for comparison, this here is the gold print. They're more or less just bragging rights to show that you've done it. Uh... I honestly kind of prefer how they handle it in the Battle Frontier anime, but that's because... Genuinely, that's just a cooler Battle Frontier. In concept, at least. Plus, they randomly mention the fact that Ho-Oh was seen in the first episode of the anime, which they really should talk about more, I feel like. For now, it's time for us to go take care of the Battle Matron over at the Battle Hall. As I mentioned last time, uh, the Battle Hall's progression is a little different to begin with, thanks to you being able to basically choose your opponents. And that also is reflected in how many battles you need to fight in order to face its Frontier Brain. You need to have beaten 50 battles in a row to face her. I guess technically 49. Additionally, getting the Gold Print here takes quite a bit more investment in battle amounts, because you need to clear 170 battles. You need to max out the 10 levels of every single type on the bottom screen to face the Frontier the second time here. Additionally, the one Pokemon the Frontier Brain uses is determined at somewhat random. The reason I say somewhat is that it's determined by the Pokemon you're using, slightly. Uh, it essentially is determined by base stat totals, which is a whole ranking system I haven't talked about where uh, Pokemon as they evolve, just... People have pulled together their base stats to sort of rank Pokemon overall. Like, uh, a certain Gen 4 Legendary is still the highest base stat total to this day, followed by like Mewtwo and a lot of Legendaries. Uh, the groups that the Battle Matron can select from are base stat total of 339 or lower, 340 to 439, 440 to 499, and 500 or higher. Because my Vaporeon's base stat total is, I believe, 525, uh, we are getting from the final group there. But outside of that, the Pokemon is chosen entirely at random, not even in regards to typing. Excuse me, please hold on a moment. In recognition of your remarkable winning streak, our Frontier Brain's demanding a match with you. Actually, you have no choice. You must battle our Hall Matron. So if you're wondering what that bottom right thing was, it's this fight. K 
Come on down! I'm only just now clicking that the battle hall is meant to be like a runway at a fashion show. I, that took me way too long to realize. My battle hall allows trainers to mount challenges with their one preferred Pokemon. I imagine there were tense moments getting here with your chosen one. Not really. But understand that one shines the brightest when a challenge is overcome. I am Argenta, and I'm your final and most daunting challenge. I dare you to overcome my challenge. So, because the Pokemon is chosen at somewhat random here, there's not much strategy I can give you besides just having a variety of types on your Pokemon to maybe take advantage of some things. For instance, by complete coincidence, she managed to choose something I'm weak to here. But because grass type is susceptible to ice, I at least have a way around it. The only other note of the Pokemon that Argenta can use is that its level is directly determined by your own. Whereas, when you're going through the battle hall normally, the battles just get higher and higher as you go through the ranks. Hers is always exactly the same as yours. So if you're entering here with like a level 20 Pokemon, her Pokemon will be level 20. I don't recommend entering this with a level 20 Pokemon, by the way. The le learn set you'd have at that point is just not going to be fully developed enough. Barring the use of TMs. Oh, I detest how fun times seem to end so quickly. Then why do you run the one where it's a one-on-one? -on -one? A good trainer doesn't force their preferred Pokemon on anyone. A good one keeps with their favorite without drama or fanfare. That's how I see it, at least. And by the way I see it, you're an excellent trainer. Be sure the business at the Battle Hall again with a favorite Pokemon. Until then, bye-bye. Eh, uh, sure. You've cleared your 10th Battle Hall match. Congratulations! For your stupendous win streak, you and your Vaporeon have awarded uh, battle points. I'm starting to stutter all of a sudden for some reason. Wow! With our time in the Battle Hall taken care of, though, it's time for us to receive our silver print. Like I mentioned, in order to get the gold print here, you need to win a whopping 170 battles in a row. I do wish they did some sort of animation to show you the print before it goes into the versus recorder, but I get it. Yeah, that'd probably be too much effort for the amount of return, given that this is all optional stuff, especially. So, here is the silver print and gold print for the Battle Hall. With that said, time for us to move on to the Battle Tower once again. What's really interesting to me about the Battle Tower in specific is it's the only... Uh, Frontier Brain that got an outright team change between Diamond and Pearl into Platinum Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Why? I don't know, but he did. That's the wrong streak sign. We need to show this one off on the left to show that I've won 14 battles in a row. Additionally, you could potentially game this Frontier Brain a little bit because there's no randomness to him whatsoever. He's always going to use the same Pokemon. On top of that, they're always going to be holding the same things and have the same movesets. You don't have to worry about predicting that kind of stuff this time around. So once you're ready, head on in and let's get on up there. I probably could have edited this a little bit differently, but oh well, we're doing it live. This is probably going to end up being one of the longer videos in the series now that I think about it. Mind you, I, I guess a part 40 special. <laughs> 40 minutes-ish for 40 parts, which I believe makes this... Even including post-game stuff, now definitively my longest-running LP. The only reason I say sort of maybe there is if I ever get to doing Final Fantasy IV The After Years, that's still technically Final Fantasy IV complete on the PSP. So that's, uh, like what, 28 for main game, I think, 3 or 4 for interlude, then however long After Years is going to be when I get there. With that said, Frontier Brain Time. Congratulations on your winning streak, Challenger! The Frontier Brain has sent word that he's impressed with you. He sees your skill and he'd like to challenge you to a battle. Are you ready to battle the Tower Tycoon? Damn right. Could you maybe walk a little faster? Hi, my name's Palmer. I heard a lot about you. You're Kyle from New Bark Town, right? You're much younger than I thought. So, I'd like you to show me. Show me the bond you've built with your Pokemon. Show me what you've learned through battles with trainers. 
Palmer, notably, much more interesting as a character in Sinnoh, because he actually has a direct connection to someone else in that game that we'll get to when I eventually reach that LP. Starting off, he's going to throw out his Dragonite, holding a Lumberry so it can randomly heal all status effects that it has on itself. Dragon Claw, Aerial Ace, Thunder Wave, and Dragon Dance. And it's not going to stick around long because four times weakness to ice. So let's move right into his next Pokemon, his Rhyperior. It's holding a Focus Band, which is just a worse Focus Sash. It has a lower chance of making a Pokemon survive a hit with one HP. Rock Wrecker, Earthquake, Crunch, and Roar. And then his third Pokemon is his Milotic, holding a Shell Bell, so any damage it does, it can heal into itself. Surf, Ice Beam, Attract, and Hypnosis. More interestingly is that he has a very legendary loaded team if you come back here at the 49th battle for the Gold Prince. It has a, he has a Regigigas with Bright Powder, so your action is going to be lower. Crush Grip, Earthquake, Stone Edge, and Drain Punch. He has a Heatran with a Focus Sash, so can survive hits with 1 HP. Magma Storm, Map, Flash Cannon, Earth Power, and Explosion. And then a Cressalia with Leftover, so at the end of turn it can just heal itself slightly with Psychic, Ice Beam, Signal Beam, and Moonlight. Out of all of the uh, Frontier Brains, I'd argue his Gold Print team is the most loaded against you, because some of them, as we saw with the Rock, will bring Legendaries. Some. Very few will bring two or three. The re only reason I say or is that people seem to be very back and forth on whether or not they consider Heatran to be a Legendary. I personally do, because of how you will find it, but... Uh, like stat total wise or something I remember or the fact that some random trainers can just have them in the anime or something people just don't like to count them as much for some reason it's a legendary to me is the point I do find it funny for two reasons though that Palmer of all people has the team of all legendaries on the gold print uh, the first reason is because of who he's the father of uh, you might remember back during the red fight I mentioned he has the highest level trainer held Pokemon and that is still true I believe to this day but only from Heart Gold, Soul Silver on. Uh, he held that record in Gold, Silver, and Crystal until Platinum, where Palmer's son, after enough battling, I think getting into like the Hall of Fame like 20 times or something, had Pokemon that were higher level than Gold, Silver, and Crystal Red. But also, Gen 4 as a concept in the anime just was where Legendary's got a weird random amount of love in the main anime, uh, to the point where a certain battle that Ash went up against in the league had two or three legendaries on his team, and it was really cheap to make him lose to that. Man, that still angers me, and it's been like, what, 14 years? I briefly foreshadowed it before. I'm really curious, or I've really talked about it before, rather. I'm really curious how the Gen 8 anime is gonna end with the whole, like, champion of champions thing they seem to be doing with it. If Ash wins that, I'll be impressed that they made him win two gens in a row. I really doubt that's what's gonna happen, though because it's the Pokemon anime. And, like, I get what they're doing. It's the whole lesson for kids of sometimes no matter how hard you try and how far you get, things just won't go your way sometimes. And that's a good lesson to teach kids. But so you can lease off on Ash a little bit, you know? <laughs> now that I think about it, I'm also kind of curious how the Gen 9 anime is going to progress. Because Journeys on the whole has done well being kind of an anime for an open world more so than uh, Gen 8 was open world. And because of Gen 9's very open-world nature to Paldia, I'm really curious if they're gonna maybe show that off by skewing the order in which Ash takes on the gym leaders or something like that. They've been doing some interesting things with that series the past couple of years, so I'm very interested. I, I, I think I mentioned it before, like, back during the Fire Red LP, but I, there's been several times across my life I've attempted to just marathon all of the Pokémon anime, but I consistently just get to the end of Johto and am exhausted. Like, that Blaziken shows up towards the end of Johto, and I'm like, I'm tired. I don't wanna. It might also be me fearing having to remember that Max exists and was a plot crutch they had to use for a while there to kind of introduce the Pokenav and all that. And man, looking back, the Hoenn anime, I just wasn't as into. Although I love the Hoenn movies arguably more than the rest of the series. Because I love the, the Manaphy movie, because I think that's technically a Hoenn movie. I love uh, the Deoxys movie. I love the Jirachi movie. They're, they got some good ones in that gen. Although now that I think about it, I just generally enjoy the Pokemon movies up to a certain point. Uh, I haven't really seen any of the ones that are like from the quote-unquote reboot timeline of I Choose You Beyond, where like they, they start Ash over and he's just alternate continuity kind of stuff. 
But even like the, I think I saw the Genesect movie at some point. I liked that enough. I really liked Detective Pikachu, but that's also a radically different kind of movie. And we're probably never gonna get a sequel to it or the game, which is kind of a shame because it's Baby's First Ace Attorney, but it's good Baby's First Ace Attorney. Uh, you know, the biggest problem that game had was it was really slow paced in its animations and making that a bit snappier would have just felt good. By the way, that's Palmer. I have no problem with losing to a spectacular trainer like you. Bravo! I imagine many great trainers will come to challenge me as you've just done. That's something I look forward to a great deal. You'll become even more skilled. Keep battling trainers from around the world. And keep growing greater in stature. Hell yeah! Thanks, Palmer. I really like your jacket, mostly because I wear the exact same color of jacket basically every day. And have been since high school. <laughs> Congratulations! In honor of your victory, we present you with this commemorative print, blah blah blah, silver print. You get a bit more for beating the Battle Tower, though. You get some ribbons for beating certain little milestones in it, like the gold and silver print battles against Palmer. But also, there's that nurse character standing right next to us for a reason. Congratulations on achieving your 20-win streak. Please accept this trophy for your fantastic achievement. We'll send it to your home. I don't ever show this off in the LP, but for winning 20 battles in a row at the Battle Tower, you get a bronze trophy. You get a silver trophy for 50 consecutive wins, and for 100, you get a gold trophy. It's just in your room at New Bark Town. There's the silver and gold print, and now it's time for us to move on to the, uh, Battle Factory. There is notably one other reward for reaching 100 consecutive wins at the Battle Tower, but I'll talk more about that in a few videos when I'm doing something more relative to it. For now, let's head on to the Battle Factory. Yay, my favorite woo. What makes going for the Frontier Brain here at Battle Factory so particularly annoying compared to some of the other ones is because of the random nature of the factory itself. You don't know what Pokemon you're gonna get, let alone your opponent. And in fact, that includes the Frontier Brain. He also can only use rental Pokemon. That means it can be anything barring the Pokemon that just aren't allowed here, period. Thus, there's no real strategy I could recommend for this particular Frontier Brain, grinding up to him or otherwise. It's just gonna be a game of luck, and hopefully you get something good. I suppose the biggest thing I can recommend is... Try to find an ace as early as you can and stick with them. Uh, from my experience, usually like one of the Mawiles you can find around here is pretty good, especially if it has Metalhead. Something with like Sableye that doesn't have many weaknesses can be pretty useful for that. It really depends on your playstyle, I suppose, but try to go for either something that's very aggressive, like a Croconaut, or something that's very defensive. Because uh, if you try to just go for a Pokemon that has too many weaknesses, or doesn't have a moveset to back it up, you're probably just not going to be in a very good spot overall. Ultimately, this is the team I'm going with to start with here, so I need to win seven more battles, which I believe I do in a jump cut coming up here after this battle transition. Well done, your party Pokemon will be healed now. Congratulations to you, trainer. In recognition of your outstanding winning streak, our Frontier Brain's demanding a match with you. So, your next match is against the product Factory Head with no right of refusal. Are you prepared? Next up, battle number seven. Are you ready? And we're using... going up against a Togekiss. Oh, God. That is such a bad matchup to start. Togekiss! Uh, I don't think I've talked about that Pokemon exactly yet. That's the final stage of the Togepi line. Which means I briefly talked about it back in uh, when our Togepi hatched. But Togekiss itself made the Togepi line worth using. Because while the middle evolution's okay, Togekiss is a ridiculous, ridiculous tank. Hello? Frontier Brain. Oh god. Bzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
Because Thornton's team is entirely random, there's no advice I can give you because of this. Try to make a good team ahead of time. Hopefully his random team can be something that you can go very hard against. Otherwise you might be in trouble. I probably also could have sped this fight up, but because it's technically a boss fight, I didn't really want to do that. It's, it's admittedly the one potential problem with how I handle Pokemon as a series now, where if, say, a boss fight runs too long, do I still consider speeding it up? I don't know. Because Pokemon, there's a whole lot to talk about. But when there's... Sometimes when you were getting this far into an LP, you might start running out of stuff to talk about besides development information, and admittedly, I'm not Chugga Conroy. I don't know a lot of Pokemon development information behind the scenes, because I don't analyze every single bit of information out there. I try my best to do research for my LPs, especially if it's a series I care a lot about. But it's not like I can say, this Pokemon, you could see an early version of its character model back in, like, my Pokemon Ranch or something like that. Although, well, I think, but I haven't really talked about that aspect, have I? Generation 4 of Pokemon's very interesting because it's arguably the most interconnected gen of Pokemon until, like, today. Because you had the three main versions of Sinnoh on the DS, which you connect with the two side games here in Heart Gold and Soul Silver. As well, it could connect with the original Pokemon Ranger to get a Manaphy. It could connect, I believe, with the later two Pokemon Rangers to get something as well, also on the DS. But then you could link up with the Generation 3 games on Game Boy Advance to send some Pokemon up. But then there was also uh, Battle Revolution and a couple of the other WiiWare titles where you could do a lot of interconnectivity there to unlock certain things in each other game. Uh, but my Pokemon Ranch is probably the most interesting one of those on the side, because it was essentially an expanded PC box in Pokemon. And if you stored enough Pokemon in there, it was the only consistent way to get a Mew as of that gen. And I think it still might be today. Uh, the big problem is, you'd have to have a Wii that has my Pokemon Ranch installed, and uh, the Wii shop's no longer available, so good luck! Nowadays, the best way to do that's probably by, I think you can use Pokemon Go to send things onto, like, my Pokemon Home or Pokemon Bank, whatever it's called nowadays. And that's probably where Pokemon's the most connected nowadays, because you can just send Pokemon into that to send them on, and I think do some stuff with spin-offs on that. I don't care to do that, because... I'm very behind on the spin-off scene nowadays for Pokemon. Like, I haven't played the remake of Mystery Dungeon. I haven't played new Pokemon Snap. Like I mentioned, I haven't played Unite, but that's also because MOBAs just aren't my genre, period. I'm very much more into the mainline games now than I used to be the side games. Which is kind of a shame, but they also just stopped making side games for a while there. Feels like after, like, Gen 5, they just kind of stopped making a lot of them. It's a bit of a shame, too, because I feel like the side games are where Pokemon tend to get really creative with their storytelling. Whoa, you sure showed me. Hmm, I got handed the loss here. It's not making me happy at all, losing. Even though I'm not happy, I did glean some useful data, I suppose. That makes me glad I battled you. So, did you like those Pokemon you rented? As the factory head, it would sure make me happy if you did. Next time, come back with different rental Pokemon. All right, and that's the Battle Factory. Thus, we're getting ourselves some more BP, as well as our gold and silver print. By this point, I believe I have enough battle points to get the Thunder Punch uh, move from that one guy in the house just south of us that I really want to get. As well as enough, I think I get another move for, like, Kenny uh, from memory. Uh, but I, I think I'd start off next video with that, so if I'm wrong, we'll find out then. So, let's take a look at it all. This is the gold and silver print for the Battle Factory. If you decide to go for the gold print, good luck, this place sucks. <laughs> Plain and simple. With that, that means there's only one Battle Frontier facility left to talk about when it comes to its Frontier brain. It's time for us to head back to the Battle Arcade. Which, you know, I like this area a lot, so at least it's a fun one to end off on. Plus, it's the only place besides the Battle Castle you can actively give yourself a handicap against the Frontier Brain. Which is satisfying, I gotta admit. 
Admittedly, it's always been one of my favorite things about playing RPGs, is having a battle you're maybe having trouble with, but then finding the one strategy that just completely destroys any kind of threat the boss fight could be. Admittedly, games like Pokemon and uh, sometimes the Shin Megami Tensei series where you're raising monsters in some regard aren't exactly the easiest to do that in because of the structure to begin with, but uh, it still somewhat applies. It's, I, I, like, I remember when uh, the Final Fantasy IV Pixel Remastered came out, I streamed through that uh, to see how it was compared to other versions. And the pixel remasters in general are good, but there's some weird damage calculation changes. And I remember I got to the second Elemental Arc Fiend fight and I one-shot it with a Thundaga that I believe I used Tella's Recall to use? Or maybe he just had that from the, the plot stuff. It's been a couple months, so I can't exactly remember. If they ever bring back the Battle Frontier in a proper way, which I doubt they will at this point because what they did to the Battle Frontier from Diamond and Pearl in the remake of that was just turn the Battle Tower into a combination of itself and I think the Battle Maison stuff from Gen 6 Beyond, so a lot less interesting. I would really like an option to just challenge a Frontier Brain if you've already fought them once to like a practice battle. You don't need to get like a silver or gold print or anything from it, just the ability to figure out if you're probably going to be good for the battle when you reach it. With that said, time for the Frontier Brain of the Arcade! Good going, we'll heal your Pokémon now. Congratulations, trainer. In recognition of your outstanding skill, our Frontier Brain is demanding a match with you. So your next match is against the Arcade Star. No ifs or buts. Are you ready? Next up, game number seven. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I already asked if I was ready. No need to worry. Let chance do what it does. Like surprises from the game board, life goes through twists and turns. No need to worry. Things will go as they will. But enough of that. I know one thing for certain. You've arrived here not merely because you were lucky. Let's not waste any time. I wish to test your skills myself. Something I believe I forgot to mention about the battle game board last time is if you use a panel that inflicts status ailments on the opponent team or your own team, it still applies any type immunity, so like steel types can't be poisoned, uh, ground types can't be paralyzed, fire types can't be burned, that usual stuff. Got myself a good handicap for this one. I always be smiling. Luck comes to those who are happy. That's why I always keep a big smile and believe in my Pokemon when I battle. Alright, Dahlia's team is probably the most straightforward out of the set. Uh... At least under the silver print. Gold print, eh, maybe not so much. Starting off, she's throwing out her Ludicolo. It's holding a muscle band, so any physical moves it uses are hot raised in power, and it has a lot of them. Waterfall, Razor Leaf, Drain Punch, and Swords Dance. Uh, as for her team, if you go for the gold print, she has a Zapdos with Bright Powder, so your accuracy is going to be lower when you're fighting it. Thunderbolt, Air Cutter, Heat Wave, and Signal Beam. A Blaziken with a White Herb, which uh, restores any uh, stats you've lowered on the Blaziken. Namely, any that inflicts on itself by using its uh, moveset of Flare Blitz, Super Power, Thunder Punch, and Night Slash. And a Toga Kiss with an Expert Belt, so any super effective moves are increased in strength. And in particular, that Toga Kiss has Hyper Beam, Air Slash, Aura Spear, and Psychic, so some good type coverage overall. I'm glad that they make the Frontier Brains hard not only to get to and at least make their ladder fights a challenge, I just wish you got more for doing them, because I think even uh, the reason that they decided to exclude the Battle Frontier from Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire came down to only a small percentage of players would actively do anything with it, so I guess in that regard I'm part of the problem, but it's also a matter of with how far Pokemon mechanics have come between the addition of another type and addition of sub-game gimmicks like Megas, uh, Z-moves, Giganta and Dynamaxing, and what's coming up to be Terrestalizing, I guess bouncing around that would just be a bit of a nightmare. Next up, we got Dahlia's Dusknor. Shadow Punch, Fling, Will-O-Wisp, and Trick Room. The reason I bring up the moves instead of the held item first is because of the move Fling. Fling's damage is determined by what the held item of the Pokemon is. In this case, it's the Iron Ball, which maxes out Fling's power at about 130. So that is a very high power move that will not miss. Or at least it's unlikely to miss, so be careful. 
the big thing is it needs to actively use that move first. This Dusknar is arguably the hardest Pokemon to find on her team because of Dusknar's overall tanky status. But if you got the right types to go up against it, it will fall down soon enough. I'll always remember just hating Dusknar in general, though. Not for how useful it is or how powerful it is, because it is useful and powerful. It's mostly because of the one in the Mystery Dungeon series. You know the one. Next up, we got our final Pokemon, a Metacham. It's holding a Salak Berry, which raises speed when it's in its last quarter of its HP. I want to say it's by, like, two or three stages, I want to say, but it's also been a while. Uh, Zen Headbutt, Reversal, Endure, and Fake Out. This is meant to be a scary Pokemon, especially because of the speed raising against things like Fake Out or Reversal, but... If you've gotten past the Dusknar, the Metacham is probably gonna be easy pickings. And that's the final Frontier Brain! You're so very, very good. My Pokemon had a good time, too. How fabulous of you. Your love of Pokemon shone through, and in turn, your Pokemon believed in you. That's why you handled everything thrown your way splendidly. A most wonderful victory it was. And that's the final Frontier Brain. So we're going to receive our last print, and that's also the last time I'm doing anything with this Battle Frontier probably ever. <laughs> Again, the Battle Frontier. Interesting experiments, some interesting challenges. But between the amount of setup you might want to do for it and how specialized some of the areas are, it's really not for everyone. And I'm one of those people that it's not for everyone. I like the Battle Tower enough and the Battle Hall overall, but the others just aren't for me. So let's take a look at our final silver and gold print before we move on to other parts of the world in the next part. And I do not remember what our next goal is. So, uh, whoops. Alright, so here's the silver and gold print. But with that, I'm gonna need to end this off here. Thank you guys for watching, and in part 41, we're gonna be spending our battle points to get some new moves for at least two people on our party. But then we're going to moving on to New Horizons. See you guys then.